It's good to come into the presence of God and to be here together for worship today. And as you will have spotted something, has everybody spotted something? Yeah, one person did already. The Reverend Karen is not here. So you've got me today to lead you through and continue our look at Mark, the Gospel of Mark, where Mark has more or less of a focus on what Jesus did and looking at his authority and what that means for us to follow him. And part of that understanding of authority is knowing that God is mighty in what he does. And I'll share a couple of verses of Psalm 89, which show the recognition of this. Lord God Almighty, none is as mighty as you. In all things you are faithful, O Lord. You rule over the powerful sea. You calm its angry waves. How powerful you are. How great is your strength. Your kingdom is founded on righteousness and justice. Love and faithfulness are shown in all you do. And so we're going to be singing together now about God's powerful hand holding us and his guidance. And as usual, please sit or stand as you prefer as we sing our first song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Let us come together as we talk with God. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, creator and renewer of all that is, we come before you singing our songs of praises, ever giving them to you. We praise you for all the gifts that you have showered upon us. We praise you for the beauty we see around us, for the infinite variety of your creation and for the unexpected and the surprising, which adds richness to our daily life. We praise you for the, your love, which surrounds and sustains and renews us, that is ever constant with us. And as we acknowledge you, we offer you our worship and love. Father God, 
we know that you offer us new life in our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. But still we shut your Spirit out of our hearts and our lives. We have tried to live in our own way and in our own strength, not recognizing your mighty deeds around us. We have drifted far away from the journey that you want us to take. Forgive us, Lord. Take our failures, our half-hearted efforts, our fears of stepping forward, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, transform our lives that we may journey with you and be persons determined for your kingdom. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray together. Our Father, who are in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. In Mark's gospel account, we have 18 miracles demonstrating the growing and expanding authority and power of Jesus. In this, Mark wishes to present to us Jesus as a teacher and master with great power. Jesus' actions saying who he is, that he is the Son of God. And as Karen said last week, that the times are fulfilled for the coming of the Messiah. Mark wants us to hear that Jesus has that authority. Although Mark's account is very short, we have three events recording about boats, and Rona is going to read one of those to us for us now. Jesus calms a storm. On the evening of that same day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd, the disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting, and they took him with them. Other boats were there too. Suddenly a strong wind blew up, and the waves began to spill over into the boat, so that it was about to fill with water. Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on a pillow. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? Jesus stood up and commanded them, the wind, be quiet. And then he said to the waves, be still. The wind died down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, why are you frightened? Do you still have no faith? But they were terribly afraid and began to say to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word to us. Thank you, Rona. We're now going to sing another song together. All over the world, the Spirit is moving.
couple of extra lines there, but uh, we, we understood, thank you, what we were doing. I'm going to start today with a little bit of a quiz. Who recognizes this person? Fiona's got a hand up, but anybody else? Rona's got a hand up. Go on. Michael Fish, the, the weatherman. No, no, that's good. Now, the question is, can anybody tell me what he was famous for? What it was called? The hurricane that wasn't happening. But it was given a name. It was called The Great Storm. And for those who are very clever, the date... There you go. There has to be somebody very clever amongst us. Well, well, well done. It was 90, It was, was 1987. And three years later, in 1990, there was the Great Burns Day storm. But even at the start of last year, we had the storms Dudley and Eunice, when they started naming storms, both named in the same, on the same day. And I remember going up to Cortique for, for a service, to take a service up there not long after that, driving along the road and going through all the trees, cut through one after another. I know the storm around my house was bad enough, but I would not like to have been up there in those trees at that storm. It was really, it was really something to see. What we have here is, in today's reading, is the Sea of Galilee. Just at the top here is Galilee here and the Sea of Galilee at the top. And the Sea of Galilee essentially is a huge lake. It's about 200 meters below sea level. In old money, that's about 780 feet for those who like the old money. Um, and due to that geography, as we see here, when the wind blows down, as we heard in the reading this morning, we can get violent and unexpected storms. It would not be unusual when the sky is so perfectly clear for a terrible storm to rise up and come across the waters and for then to be so, for, uh, uh, to cancel out that calmness that was there. Having said that, as we heard in this morning, we know that several of the disciples were seasoned fishermen, and so they would have spent their lives fishing on this lake, knowing about it. But they suddenly had this uh-oh feeling when this storm came about. Of course, just imagine being in that boat. But not quite in this condition. And this boat is from the first century, when it was the time of Jesus, and it was found on, in 1986 on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it really shows the type of boat that we're talking about that from, that re from our reading today. And thinking about that boat in a little bit more reality, we have this very moving picture painted by Rembrandt. In preparing for this service, I recall that my father gave, my, sorry, my godfather gave me a very small plaque when I was very young, and it had this picture on it. But at that time, I hadn't realized the significance of what he'd given to me. I, I do now, and unfortunately, I have misplaced the plaque somewhere. It was when I was this, this sort of high. And looking at this storm, we can see the wildness of the waves. We can think of those disciples maybe naturally panicking, that everything was against them, that their end was nigh. You can just imagine their dad's army phrase a moment, we're doomed, Captain, we're doomed. But we also note in our reading that their captain was really unaware that we see an unconcerned. But this voyage of being taken across the lake and undertaken at the express request of Jesus, and the disciples did so unquestioningly, this then may have made the calming of the storm all the more harder for them to understand, for them to really trying to get their head around the relaxed attitude of Jesus, that being quite baffling to them. But we can see that Jesus' sleep did not only show natural weariness, part of his humanity. It also showed his tranquil faith. It's interesting that in Mark, that compared with the corresponding uh, accounts in the Matthew and Luke Gospels, as you heard Rona read, 
is it talks about Jesus' head on a pillow. You don't, you don't get that in the other two gospel accounts. Anyway, from today's reading, we note that it's more than mere observation watching Jesus. More than listening to him, more than hearing him, was required by the disciples for true discipleship on their journey with Jesus. This event could have possibly just passed by if the disciples had realized that with Jesus in their boat, Jesus resting in their midst, they were perfectly safe in the storm. Their waking him showed how far they still had to go on their journey. And this is not so different from last week at Elevenses, for those who are here, when the Reverend Karen was talking about the people of Israel being asleep, that they were to wake up and understand. Okay, here it's Jesus asleep, but in reality, the disciples also were still asleep. They were still asleep to the truth. Having been woken, Jesus calms the storm. And for those of us also here on Sunday, we heard about the healing of the paralyzed man, let down through the roof. And here in these verses in Mark, there's a new revelation of Jesus as God. Mark stating this fact. In the Old Testament, God is seen as in control of the natural world. The God, our God, who parted the Red Sea before his people Israel. And here, Jesus is now doing the same for the disciples, showing them that he is God and they are the people of God. The wind and waves in an instant obedience to Jesus, be quiet, be still. Moving from his full humanity of being asleep, to his full divinity as being our creator God. But as we know, we've heard this story many times before, and it's Mark focusing on the actions of Jesus. And it's more than the physical sense of the calming of the storm, even though that in itself is a great miracle. We see that that miracle of authority is something that Jesus has with him. And here we can see Jesus, though, giving us a pointer, a pointer to the peace in the storm of our anxieties. The chief enemy of our peace is worry for ourselves, worry about the unknown future, worry about our loved ones. But when Jesus speaks, he speaks with an authority that those we love and ourselves can be surrounded with even in a storm of anxiety. He can still us, and with that authority, bring us the peace and love of God. But there's also an uncomfortable issue for us in this reading, this sharp exchange between the disciples and Jesus. We could probably have sympathies with the disciples on that boat, as I said they, earlier, they had some experienced fishermen, fishermen among them, and they knew the lake well, but not all of them were. And Rembrandt probably demonstrates this by this person in red leaning over the side of the boat, and that could well be one of us if we were in that situation. But most of us think that it's others who will panic, but it's normally the experts who recognize the need to panic. For example, we see many disaster films where volcanoes are about to explode, comets come hurling down towards Earth. And when some expert points this out, nobody wants to listen or believe them. And in contrast to the disciples here, we have on the face of it a carpenter completely ignoring the obvious signs of that extreme danger not taking any precautionary measures. And so, whatever moved the disciples to ask their question, their feeling of having been neglected in their safety by Jesus sleeping, the disciples' question 
teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? Do you think they were ready for the reply when Jesus calmed the storm? Why are you frightened? Do you still have no faith? And in this story, we, this very exchange, we have it, the heart of the journey of our discipleship. The disciples were looking to Jesus to do something. Jesus was looking at the disciples to trust him. Him being with them was the key, the key to their survival. So we have this, we have this essential message for us, it should be enough to be with our Lord Jesus Christ, whether our life seas are running smoothly or not. We see in the Bible, faith and fear often come together. A lack of faith on the disciples' part gave into the fear that they were about to drown. And it was for that lack of faith that Jesus was rebuking them. The simple statement, do not be afraid, is often heard in the Bible. But the disciples still feared. And we see them again and again not getting it, that Jesus was fully human, but also was the Son of God and to be trusted. We are often taken in by offers of things that promise continual success, more excitement, better growth. But these in themselves will not only lead to frustration and disaster, but they actually point us in the wrong direction, the wrong direction in our journey of faith. We need to recognize that it's enough for Jesus to be with us on our journey. But in this we need to take care that in those rough seas that sometimes we will be sailing in, that we don't judge how much our Lord Jesus Christ cares for us, that we think we're being abandoned, that we think he is asleep in our lives. We need him to be involved in our lives, both in the good times and the tough times. The disciples lived with Jesus, but they still underestimated him. They did not see that his power applied to their very own situation. Being Jews, they knew their history. And as I mentioned earlier, God parting the Red Sea for their escape from Egypt. They knew the power of God. They knew what was actually possible. And Jesus has been with us, his people, for over 2,000 years. And yet, we, like the disciples, can sometimes underestimate his power in our own lives. The disciples did not yet know enough about Jesus, questioning, who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. We should not be able to make the same excuse. To journey with Jesus is to be, be with him and have him at the centre of our lives. To have that inbuilt faith, even in a storm, knowing that he is the creator God over all, that Jesus is the one we have to turn to, his authority. He has that authority for us to place our trust in him over everything. And Paul sums this up in his letter to the Galatians. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. Can we say that? We come before God again in prayer. Let us pray. 
ever-loving God. We, your people, come putting our trust in you to have you at the centre of our lives. We give you thanks this day for all you do for us. You have created us and you sustain us and your loving arms embrace us and all our brothers and sisters here in our community and of many nations. Yet, Lord, there are many storms all around us. We wake each day to the troubles across your world. We lift before you the many small and large wars that rage on, that bring so much death and destruction, not only to those actively fighting, but those caught up directly because of where they just happen to be living, and indirectly with all the knock-on consequences that we see of these wars. We pray especially for Ukraine, that your guiding hand may come into the situation and your love surround all those suffering. As well, we pray for the situation in Palestine and Israel, the place where you lived your life on earth and calmed storms. We ask you to come into the tension there with your words of authority, that your peace may come over the land. And as we heard from the psalmist, your kingdom is founded on righteousness and justice, yet there are many storms of unrighteousness and injustice. We lift to you all those who are struggling as refugees, those locked in modern slavery, those suffering abuse. May your love come into these situations and may you deliver them from oppression. We hear of natural disasters, the latest in Turkey and Syria, with many thousands dead and many more affected. You know their needs, and we pray that all the aid offered by many countries will meet those needs. We pray for all those helping in the recovery. Give them strength in all they do. And as we look out of our own windows, we see the storms in our own community. We pray for all those affected by the cost of living, the real impact this is having on their lives in many ways, including their mental and physical health. May they hear in loving tenderness your authoritative words, be still. And may the work done from here at the Lausen speak into their hearts, that they may come to know your kingdom and all they mean to you. We pray for all those known to us who are faced with sickness, those nearing the end of this life, and those who have recently lost loved ones. May they and their families know to turn to you in trust, seeking your sustaining love. We ask you to give them your comfort and your peace. We take a moment to lift before you those we wish to individually name. In coming together, we thank you for the supreme gift of human history, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he knew the love of an ordinary human family, the affection of friends, that he shared the common experience of humanity, the joys and sorrows, the sunshine and the storms of daily living. We thank you for his ministry, his death and his resurrection, and for the new life which he gives to those who have faith in him today. We thank you that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, whose power every day renews us, guides us, and enables us. Knowing all this, we offer our lives to you in thankfulness and in faith. And we ask that you'll use each one of us in the service of your kingdom, that in doing so, we will place you at the centre of our lives, in the authority that you have over our lives. We pray all this in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Thank you very much for joining today. 
and especially also for those online who I forgot to welcome right at the beginning. You are welcomed, but thank you very much for joining us. Um, for those who are going through to Lunch Club, I do hope you have an enjoyable lunch and a fantastic time of fellowship as well. Um, and I hope to see many of you again soon. I know I won't be here next week because I have a lecture that I should have had yesterday that was delayed through to today. But hopefully many of you will be able to come again next week. We do acknowledge that we have our Lord Jesus Christ who holds us through and the storms that we face. So let us stand, if you wish, and sing the song, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life? So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen.